Good afternoon and welcome to Investable Nuclear Energy, a conference offered by GW Law School. I am very pleased to welcome our next guest, Dr. Stephen Arndt. Dr. Arndt holds the position of Distinguished Scientist at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He is also the Vice President of the American Nuclear Society and will assume the position of President as of June 2022. Today, he will speak to us on the topic, New Technology, Old Problems, the Need to Take a Fresh Look at Nuclear Policy and Regulation. Dr. Arndt is an internationally recognized expert in the field of nuclear engineering. In 2012, he was named the Federal Engineer of the Year by the National Society of Professional Engineers, the first nuclear engineer ever be awarded that honor. In 2020, Dr. Arndt was awarded the NSPE Award, the highest honor given specifically to a professional engineer. His additional achievements and accolades are numerous. And so in the interest of time, I would refer you to his online biography rather than spend time listing, listing them here. With that, I turn this over to Dr. Arndt. Okay, great. Uh, can you see my, my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges that we have and the need to look at our policy and regulation in a new way. Um, so I've got about 10 slides, they're not real fancy. Um, what I, I make up in fancy slides, I'll hopefully uh, have uh, some uh, more controversial things to talk about. Um, so first thing, so I'm gonna talk really briefly about the American Nuclear Society because I think it brings something to the table, a short into, intro and talk about new technology, talk about some of the challenges and then get to the last two slides, which is really what I wanna talk about, which is the need for change. Um, the American Nuclear Society is the professional society for nuclear engineers and for nuclear professionals generally. Uh, you can see our vision and our mission up there. We're there to provide the opportunity to enhance nuclear energy science and technology for the benefit of society as a whole. And one of the things that we do a particularly good job of is supporting diversity of thought. And that can be the traditional diversity that you see uh, in a DIA type statement that can be diversity of input from all different perspectives, as well as bringing new ideas and new people to the community. So I think one of the things that we really need to do is use tools like professional societies to try and bring those diverse ideas, diverse perspectives to the community. Um, and if you look at our website, you can uh, see that we've had a number of diverse presidents of the society and other things that add a little bit of credibility to that statement. First, a little bit about terminology. You've probably heard some of this uh, before over the course of the last day and a half, but we keep throwing around terms and I just wanted to make sure everyone understood what they were. Um, high temperature reactors or, temp or, or reactors of any kind that have high core outlet temperatures, micro reactors or reactors that are very small in terms of their electric or other outputs, as we were uh, told uh, in the previous presentation, the real output of a reactor is heat. What we do with that, whether it's for industrial purposes or electric generation or whatever, um, there's some confusion and from a lawyer standpoint, I understand this is incredibly frustrating. It's frustrating for me. Um, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act defined advanced reactors in a way that most of the technical people in the world would not define, um, which is another reason I think we need to have these discussions at a technical, legal, and professional level before we put this uh, kind of verbiage into law, but that's uh, uh, something I'll get to later. Advanced reactors and new reactors as a whole are moving toward commercial commercialization and, and operation very quickly. 
We've got venture capital in the business for the first time in, in my career, certainly in the first time in, in many, many years. Um, we've got a lot of US and other countries pushing forward. We've got support from the federal government. These are some of the programs that, that uh, we've talked about already in this meeting. Um, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program and the Risk Reduction Program. They're looking for relatively near-term development, uh, the Advanced Reactor Concept Awards, um, Project Pele, for those of you who are not familiar, is a DOD award, um, which is looking at using microreactors for uh, DOD purposes. So there's a lot of work going on. Uh, I'll flash this slide just very briefly. It talks to the diversity of programs that are out there. We've got light water reactors, we've got high temperature gas reactors, we've got uh, molten salt reactors, we've got uh, liquid metal reactors, we've got what is known as heat pipe reactors. So the, the technology is moving forward very quickly. These tend to have multiple applications. They can be used for a number of things, just like our last speaker talked about. They have increased efficiency. They are nominally simpler and safer. They should have significantly smaller emergency planning zones and they have very low life cycle carbon emissions. So they have enormous technical advantages. And what I really wanna talk about is, are these technical advantages gonna solve the challenges we've had with some of nuclear technology in the past? And can that advantages of the new technology overcome some of the problems? And when I say problems, I don't really want to harp on why nuclear has not been as successful as it, as it should be or could be. I want to talk about how we can make the process conform to the technology. So there's a lot of new technology out there. There's new applications in the, the, the second bullet there. We're talking about the new construction and development methodologies. Uh, we're developing in a much more efficient way. We're coming up with new technology in a much more efficient way. We've got modular construction, which should hopefully be more effective. We've got the whole digital twins, and I'm going to use that not as the detailed digital twin, but as more of a generic. We have digital tools to improve both the design licensing and construction of nuclear power plants. And we have much, much more sophisticated analytical tools. There's a, a big desire to use those tools to cut the development cycle and the testing cycle and the licensing cycle. And the real question is, can we do that in an effective way? So let's look at some of the challenges that has been experienced in the nuclear business over the last 60 years. You have high capital costs, you have infrastructure issues, and I mean that in the most general way. We have lack of research facilities, a lot of them have closed down. We have supplier infrastructure issues. We have long construction times. We have challenges occasionally with quality assurance. You saw that in, in uh, the summer uh, build, proliferation concerns, security requirements. Are the new technologies solving this problem, these kinds of problems? And my statement is, I think they're doing everything they can from a technological standpoint to solve the problems. We have more proliferation resistant systems, we have systems that require less bodies in terms of security. We have infrastructure that is working toward being more effective. Um, 
I'll skip over spent fuel right now because uh, time is short. Um, but we've got a process moving forward. I have a lot of reservations about the consent-based licensing process, not because I don't think it's a good idea and it's the right thing to do. My concern is the boundary conditions we're going to in, impose on the consent-based site. What does consent mean? Who are the players? How do we bound in a reasonable way to be inclusive, but not so inclusive that you cannot come to a conclusion on consent? Who has to be involved? So to get to the bottom line, the big issues I see are policy, regulatory, and to some extent, industry. At the policy level, I think we need to go back to our friends that set policy, be they Congress, be the administration, be the regulatory bodies, and start looking at things that are broken. First and foremost, we need to make science-based policy. Now, we keep talking about this, but we don't necessarily always follow through. One of the key issues is what does the science really tell us? If you look at things like the linear no-threshold model, it's a convenient thing to kick around and say, well, it, it's not resolved science, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is we know it's not a particularly good model. We know it's an overly conservative model. And whether or not we can agree on what a better solution is or not, we know that we're not analyzing the real risks of these systems based on an, an appropriate science-based model. We need to fix that. And we don't need to do research for the next 20 years to fix that. That is something that is fixable in a life cycle of an administration. That is something that is fixable in the life cycle of a federal appointee. And the fact that we haven't fixed it in those kind of time periods is just plain wrong. Are our regulations appropriate? I think our regulations are actually pretty good but frequently they are not fully integrated. You may have one requirement from American Society of Mechanical Engineers laying on top of a requirement from American Society of Civil Engineers, and you've got margins on both of them. There's a very good MIT study done uh, four or five years ago on this, and we need to fully integrate the regulatory margins in our analysis. We need to look at the real security risk. We need to do it in a good scientific way. Jumping up and down about an airplane crashing into a containment building is great media, but it's not necessarily the best way to do a proper security analysis. We need to look at how to best frame the spent fuel argument. Again, at the policy level for the playing field, I'll hit a couple of these real quick. Grid access. We talk about the issues associated with how much or how little um, government subsidies various energy sources have. That's an important argument, but it's not nearly as important as issues associated with grid access. If you're going to say a technology is necessary to support the grid, then you have to have equal grid access for renewables and for nuclear. Another issue associated is the cost of regulation. The utilities have to pay for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to regulate them. And there's more than just the money there. It sets a tone between the regulators and the industry that is entirely counterproductive. It drives the industry to try and look at the NRC's budget in a very unproductive way. And that's got to get eliminated. I'll go to my last slide. I know I'm running a little late. The regulators 
really need to look at what the real risks are, not the perception of risks. We also need to look at if we want a particular outcome, like a two-year review cycle, then we have to stop accepting applications that can't be reviewed in two years. It's, it, it is just plain bad for everyone when we accept an application for review by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, when we say our, our goal is to review it in two years and we know that there is no way it's going to be reviewed in two years, whether it's because the application is incomplete or the knowledge of the regulator, be it code, standards, testing, whatever, is incomplete. we got to stop fooling ourselves when we say that. Equally, we need to expect the regulator from the very highest levels to be the experts. I can't tell you the number of times I've been in an NRC meeting when the industry is basically saying, you guys don't know anything about what you're regulating. Well, first of all, I don't think that's true 90% of the time, probably a higher percentage of the time. But more importantly, we need to have that expectation. And we need to have that expectation from the commissioners all the way down to the lowest tier reviewers. I remember the commission back when we had people that were members of the National Academy and equal quality professionals running the commission. And nothing against political wonks on the commission. There's a lot of very talented people who understand nuclear law, but we need to have more people that understand the technology, positive, negative, whatever political affiliation, but really understand what's going on with the technology running the commission and all through the le levels of the commission. I'll leave this with talking about the industry a little. We need to have a more re realistic paradigm associated with things. We can't have and a miracle occurs somewhere buried in the schedules that we have. And the industry itself has got to be more of an advocate for its own technology. I think that's starting to change. But we have a lot of utilities and a lot of suppliers that are not strong advocates for their own technology compared to their competitors. And if you're going to be in this business, you got to be out there. And at that, I'll, I'll be quiet and we can move on to our next presentation. Dr. Arndt, that was fantastic. I really appreciate you participating today. Um, we have this whole schedule sliding a little bit here. Uh, so I just ask our audience that uh, you will move on to the next presentation and we will pick up with Dr. Schaefer. But I want to thank you again. That was really, really enlightening and I appreciate it. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you.